few people that were starting to focus on how do we create value with the data, which was fantastic. I was really impressed. It was good to hear about it. And over to you. Thank you so much, Howard. Well, uh, I must say I'm impressed. I think you remember better than I do. Uh, 2013 is a long time ago. <laughs> um, thank you very much. Um, and thanks to everyone. I've, I'm really excited seeing so many names that I know um, and have worked with. Uh, it feels like a mini reunion for me. Um, and uh, just checking quickly whether you can all see my screen. And now I'm going to stop sharing because I don't know whether I have shared with sound. We can, so we can again. see you. We could see it. Now we see you. <laughs> and there we go. I just want to make sure I include sound. There we go. There we go. Cool. So you all saw the blurb. I'm going to start off with um, disclaimers. If, uh, if you're expecting a, a technical unpacking and architectural review of the data mesh framework and approach, uh, I'm not an architect. I'm a governance lady and I'm a business lady. So um, I'm going to try and give a, a bit more of a business slant to it. However, I've had the, the privilege of being part of a project here in South Africa where we started Greenfields. And we're on this journey of implementing a data mesh. So I have some lessons learned, some aha moments, some lingering questions. So this is really just for me to say, play back some of the thoughts and ideas we've developed as we've experimented with this. Um, and uh, in this forum to get some, um, some feedback on that as well. Okay. Um, and I want to kick off with um, first asking and putting the true north down. Why are we doing this? And I loved last year when Gartner wrote in their data and analytics trends that given that every digital moment leads to a decision that is powered or held hostage by data and analytics, it's no wonder that it is a chronic issue that's becoming more and more acute. And um, I'm going to start off just by reflecting on where have we come from to try and solve exactly this problem. And um, one of my passions, one of my dreams is to see enterprises be smart. Um, enterprises really having this ability to tap into an enterprise wide brain that is connected everywhere. So in that spirit, I'm not uh, going to kick off doing all of the talking. I have a little video clip just to help. Oops, that shouldn't be there. Um, <laughs> just to set up, uh, set the scene and build this analogy of building a brain. What do we want to achieve by doing that? Yeah, here we go. We are blessed with a symphony of multi-sensory experiences yeah. and sensations. The whole, the whole brain, when functioning correctly, is a phenomenal dance, coordinating 20 million billion bits of information every second and mapping a three-dimensional projection of the world in a flurry of insight and deeply personal experiences. Synaptic pruning is the process of synapse elimination that occurs in a developing brain that is shedding unnecessary connections. The selection of the pruned connections follow the use it or lose it principle, or neurons that fire together, wire together. This means synapses that are frequently used have strong connections, while the rarely used synapses are eliminated. In this way, the brain creates a specific and mature circuitry that is primed for handling the complexities of daily human life. That sets the scene. I mean, a corporate brain, what we've been trying to do since the advent of the data warehouse is to, to build this ecosystem 
that helps us tap into our data. And in those data points, there's connections to be built, there's um, inferences to be made, there's insights to be unlocked. Um, and all of the different approaches, all of the frameworks and methodologies are all aimed at that. So today we're pausing, today we're saying, how, how does the data mesh framework from ThoughtWorks and Zamak Degani try to do that? Um, and a kind of framing an objective statement in the spirit of uh, what we just saw in this video is everywhere in the organization, in every frontline part of operations and back office part of operations, data is being recorded. The, we're not trying to manage the data for the sake of data and managing the data. We're managing the data for the sake of building this 3D model map of the context in which our organization operates so that we can understand its complexity, understand the volatility, remove the uncertainty so that businesses can lead their businesses. That, that's why we want to do it. And now, quoting Zamak, she believes the data mesh approach is very carefully shaped to do, help exactly do this with a few key objectives. And in her words, um, she shaped it, or they shaped it to enable businesses to respond gracefully to change, to sustain agility in the face of growth, and to generate business value, to increase that ratio of value from data to investment um, and to getting return out of that. Um, now, thinking about just the analogy of the brain and how the brain develops. And in, in my personal experience of being a parent, it is amazing to see those million billion bits of data that your brain processes. As you raise your child, as you go through the process, um, it is takes a lot of careful thinking, careful action, very intentional action to shape your child's brain to build those synapses and those neural pathways to become a productive, functional, and wise adult. And that's exactly what we want to achieve with any data platform. Howard. Yes, Solanda, I, I really am interested in that last line where you talk about increase, increase the ratio of value from data to investment. So is, you're not really, you're talking about a new ratio. Is that different from ROI, the, the return on investment of data? Or is it, it seems it's, uh, I'm not sure if I'm understanding it properly. Um, that, it, it's interesting because that's also um, the, the what, what she tries to achieve in that ratio is to scale, to say, okay. well, um, we want to get as many and as much of the organization tapped into this data and on every periphery in the organization being able to tap value out of it. Um, okay. Where, where um, historically it seems like investment in data is excessive, but there's no clarity of what is the value coming out of that. And that is the ratio that um, she has the objective to shift in this data mesh approach with that inten okay. intentionality of scaling. Right, thank you. So, before we dive into how she wants to do it, how this framework intends to do it, maybe just a quick reflection. I think everyone in this forum has borne the scars and has um, been through some kind of journey it probably resonates with this picture. But the reality is, regardless of what framework you are using, any organization is using, 
data lake, data warehouse, data marts, lake houses, fabrics, you name it. We all have this same context. We have various business areas. All of those business domains are actively operating the business. Stuff is happening and in everyday activities, data is being generated, data is being originated. Those data points reflect what has happened in the business. It reflects the responses of the market to the business. And our aspiration is to be able to collect those data points somewhere so that we can start building these synapse connections between the data points and we can infer and generate insights. But then we need to play it back. We need to make it accessible in a similar way as when uh, an infant starts experimenting by touching and with each action get feedback response and that feedback response goes to the brain uh, fires a synapse and then the child takes another action and that repetitiveness is what builds the experience and builds the growth in the brain in a similar way we need to replicate that activity but we struggle with scale and what does that mean regardless of frameworks approach we all know that even if you only centralize in business units and not in head office of an enterprise who has not struggled with um, saying, uh, bottlenecks to your data teams who has managed to and you can just uh, throw a, uh, an applause or a heart or a laughter on the screen if you have not hit some kind of bottleneck or frustration people saying hey guess what i can't wait until your team builds this for me i'm gonna go rogue and i'm gonna build my own little thing on the sideline that's the reality of data and enterprises at the moment but then they go and do that out of this delay frustration and we start ending up with fragmentation all over we have teams all over um, replicating the same data processes ingesting or sourcing the same data trying to make sense of it um, generating insights but then having different versions of the truth etc and that fragmentation then comes back with repercussions. Comes back with the repercussions that data is not trusted. Comes back with the fact that CRO is um, in this more and more increasingly regulated data world, um, feeling uncomfortable with the level of confidence of are we compliant with POPIA? Are we compliant with GDPR and all the other regulations out there? Um, and then we start asking questions. Why is the data not trusted? Why uh, aren't we compliant here? Are we compliant here? And because of this pseudo BI data behavior that ha happens spontaneously in the organization, there's a lack of accountability. Everyone's hands up and say, well, I'm just doing what I can, but it's not me. This is not my data. And so with all of this to and fro, we get stuck in this loop of at least most organizations here in South Africa, from my experience, gets management information out. But only small pockets in every business really gets to that advanced insights, really gets to the point where they can claim to say, you know what, I'm running my business better because of my data and because of the insights I generate out of that. So quick history lesson, which I'm, I'm going to fly through because we all know it, but if we're talking about the brain, even the brain has evolved over millions of years. So how has the corporate brain evolved? 
you know the answer, but thanks for asking the question. Um, sorry. <laughs> We've reduced. <laughs> we have, we started with um, Father Kimball and um, Uncle Imnon. Here, we built data warehouses. Very basic. The principle is let's get, collect data, let's prepare and scrub the data and make it business friendly, and then let's present that back to the business. And then we evolved slightly. We said, okay, you know what, if, if we're doing this for more and more business areas, then maybe we'll throw in a little bit of orchestration and workflow management across all of these back then labeled ETL um, processes, now probably called pipelines. Let's get some cataloging done. Let's build an uh, inventory of our data. Um, let's log and monitor the flow of the data and create a little bit of an audit trail. How do we grapple with security and, and how do we now govern this? And we started there. And um, this is when I started my career. And I think we were on a very good track. And then, lo and behold, big data technology came and disrupted everything. And we threw everything we've learned over a period of 20 years out the window. And we said, uh, let's just do data lakes. Let's just build a lake, dump all the business data from sources in and let the business lose to make sense out of the data. Um, and this is not this is not a bad evolution because this evolution gave rise to the the technology catching up and being able to process the data so that data science can come to the fore. I always joke, I say um, data scientists have existed forever. They just didn't have the technology. They were called actuaries. Um, and they had to do it on uh, on spreadsheets or on Excel based Monte Carlo simulations that would run for two weeks to get one predictive model out. Uh, but now we had our data in data lakes and we at least could get those actuaries, those highly data literate analyst communities in the business loose on the data, but we couldn't do much more. Because now the data was not business sensitive and business friendly anymore. So we started to grapple a little bit with that. And we also started to grapple with how do we become, um, uh, how do we activate action from this data? So we matured data lake slightly. And we added some event driven architecture in. We added some stream processing in, we added um, AI and machine learning in. Um, and in the more literate industri industries, especially financial services, I saw them starting to create feedback loops back into the sources. Um, but this is still not sufficient because we can't keep up with the scale at which the business actually needs this data. So, latest uh, last five or six years, um, well, maybe not five or six years, maybe two or three years, we started talking about lake houses, which is the hybrid. It's going back to the fundamentals and it's saying, well, let's now bring that robust discipline of from Kimball and Inmon. Let's bring it back, but let's pair it up now. Now we have data lakes and we have the warehouses and the data marts. Um, and we retain that AI and ML data science sandboxes and environments. And we have this hybrid of technologies all in one platform. But now we're still hitting that wall. We, we're hitting the wall of scaling because the platform 
having this massive, massive platform in one place forces an operating model that is centralized, maybe somewhat federated. Um, I've seen it being fed federated in organizations that's brave enough to get line of business users working directly on the platform. Um, but it remains constrained. And that is where the data mesh comes in now. Because what the data mesh approach says, let's do all of that, but let's simplify it and shrink it down and clone it multiple times. And then let's put protocols, practices, and technologies over that, that now starts building this up. So, I mean, thinking about the water analogy, if you have a data lake as your central catchment area of all data, this environment says, okay, you know what? Let's go and build multiple ponds. And each of those ponds capture data. And in a bit of a more of a micro um, environment, still do everything we want to do, but for a more micro focused area or community. But now we duplicate it, and that's why you see all of these what we uh, nodes. We're now saying you let's take this pattern, let's copy and paste it multiple times. We, let's get a lot of uh, a lot of different teams. We decentralize now. We bring self service in place. And this is where I, I want to stop quickly because. Um, I don't know how much, how many of you have um, have researched data measures in detail, but I want to stop here and, and say from your experience, what, what are the core questions now that pops up? Where you say, okay, that's nice, but what if? And what about this? Andrew. Um, thanks, Andrea. Thanks for taking the question. So, how's having a data mesh different from having a virtualization tool that didn't you know, sound like that's on top of your data? Um, that's interesting because this is act, this is not virtualized. This is physical environments in smaller capacity, smaller scale. But now you scale out by creating lots of them, almost similar to what the the big data um, um, physical architecture is to have these commodity um, infrastructure all hooked together and scaling like that. But now you're doing it with the, the full shebang. You're doing it with the, the people and the um, tin, the environment and the data practices. Um, and maybe if, if we go into uh, uh, lift up the hood a bit and look at the kind of guiding principles, maybe that becomes clear. Um, this is not virtualized. It could be virtualized um, if your virtualized technologies can keep up with the, the scaling um, and your data processing um, does not become a blocker as it deteriorates. Does that address your question, Andrew? Great. Yeah, thank you. I still need to just uh, think about it, wrap my head around it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so it, maybe... it's, it's a massive paradigm shift, so it takes time. <laughs> Be with me yeah. as we unpack this. So maybe it... I can, yeah. Um, Andrew, there's really nice work that Martin Fowler did in terms of data driven development, where he, he broke his areas up into data domains. And then they extended that with microservices and almost allowed each team to look after and build its own domain and manage its own software and hardware. So you never had, you didn't have, you weren't restricted to one lake. You were now, each person created basically their own environment per domain and then allowed you to have this interaction between domains using microservices. And that's 
where the scary part comes in in terms of now I've got uh, data and I've got to bring the whole domain together in a mesh of microservices and interaction between elements, if, if I understand that correctly. And then, uh, rightly said the scary part. Marcel. Hi, thanks. Um, my question is, it's all fine and well, um, or at least in theory, but my biggest question would be, it's hard enough to have a competent centralized data team to maintain, curate, and um, make sure, uh, you know, the uh, <clears throat> um, system of record and data waste warehouse all ticking fine. So how would you go about with, you know, any um, mid to large size company actually implementing a data mesh right. if every team needs to have some individual who can actually not only understand the, um, the area of business um, or their division, um, their business division, but how to translate that into a data product, which requires, I think, quite some technical skill at least. Yes. Um, yeah, and I guess this is where a lot of products try to show themselves, you know, but even if you take something like Kafka, I mean, you, you need quite a, quite a lot of technical skills to actually uh, produce a topic or something. So that's my biggest question, which I haven't really got an answer as yet in, all, in, in my yep. experience so far of this new paradigm. Thanks. Yeah, especially um, in, uh, in our country where skills is, is a big, big problem. And even data literacy, basic data literacy are, are challenges. Um, so uh, I'll let you know when I find out, but <laughs> I, will, I will give you some ideas of, of how we're currently um, thinking about it at one of our clients as we go through the principles. Maybe, um, uh, Don, to your question on the chat, uh, I, there's no off-the-shelf data mesh service provider technology um, yet. There are uh, various different kind of um, white papers on how to do it on the different clouds. Uh, but yes, it is a massive paradigm shift and a massive skill shift that uh, we need to think about. Hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I fully agree with you, Bilash. Data mesh is not a technology, it is a whole paradigm, it is a whole framework and, and a way of doing things. So let's look at that. Um, what is a data mesh? In Zamak's words, it is a decentralized socio-technical approach to share, access, and manage analytical data in complex and large-scale environments. Now, I'm looking at the clock and I'm going to have to um, go through the core principles relatively quickly, but she builds this whole framework on four, four pillars. Domain data ownership, data as a product, the self-service data platform, and then the concepts of federated computational um, governance. So that lands the point and affirms the point that this is not just a technology. It, it, it's really a whole operating model covering people, processes, and technology together. So let's dive in to um, what is meant with domain data ownership. And in everyone in this community that's been exposed to enterprise data modeling, et cetera, is starting to think uh, party, role, um, uh, product, et cetera. That is not what we're talking about here. We're talking about domain-driven um, data ownership and more specifically, close alignment to the business domains. So starting off, there's a concept of, of the archety archetypes of domain data products. <laughs> yes. Um, good interview questions. Um, take take the recording and go and script it um, if you're looking for people in this space. But classifying different data product domains into archetypes, um, she talks about, if you think about source data, 
the data you build typically out of a data warehouse and then the data you get when you start now cross-functionally mashing this data up in data science spaces. Um, your archetypes could be that you have data domains that is native or atomic, that is very closely aligned with the source or the business process where this data is originated, where it's sourced, where it's authored. Or you can have data domains um, packaged around the type of information or aggregated domains um, where that's your typical BI. I, I've labeled it colloquially with my client as information products. It is taking data products, mashing it up a little bit, enriching it, cleansing it, and then presenting it within the context of a business um, scenario um, back to the business to use. And then finally, she talks about consumer aligned domain data. And this is when you start really with your data science, et cetera, mashing up from multi discipline disciplines in your business. Um, data not sure. and um, that uh, that then gets so rich that you can do your cause and effect relationships um, and discover cause and effect patterns, etc., predictive behaviors, and so on across the business. Okay, so th this is not that big um, bureaucratic or, or um, heavy governance data domain planning that you do. It's very much practically thinking about where's your business. Where does data get originated? And then making sure that you structure and enable the spots where, as an example, data gets originated or captured, the business processes where that happens, create a capability close to that to capture that data, but publish it onto the mesh in, um, that is business friendly, not as it is captured in source. But then you have your information data products that gets derived from that and enriched and used for BI purposes. But then you could get spaces in your business where typically like market research or research and development, product development, those are the kind of business domains that may not originate a lot of detail or a lot of data, but they are very, very interested in using and consuming data from all of these business areas and getting rich insights out of that so that they can um, inform their product development and their market research activities, et cetera. So these might be business areas that is very much inside domains, as we call it, or um, as she calls it, use case or consumer aligned domains. Um, and the principle she brings in here is this is not a one dimensional data ownership model. This is a multifaceted, multi dimensional approach to data ownership. So if you're looking for who is the owner of customer data? Oh my gosh, I've had that debate in so many businesses and every time they start, they asking me, okay, data ownership, I want to do data governance. Who owns customer? That's very difficult because customer might have certain data elements that's common, but each line of business might be looking at their customer through a different lens. So the data mesh does not necessarily move towards creating that single, single enterprise view of a common data domain, but rather say, let's agree high level standards around it, but then let's put our ownership down in all of the businesses to own the different archetypes of data that is relevant in their business area. 
it is going to become clearer when I go into the next principle. I promise, because now I'm going to use a little bit of an analogy to make it uh, slightly more tangible. Okay. And the next principle is data as a product. And oh my gosh, I love this. I love this paradigm and this thinking around the data. So what do we mean with that? Um, uh, we're going to stop whining about our data, but I'm going to use an analogy of the wine manufacturing value chain because we're talking about data as a product. So let's go into the product manufacturing industry and learn from them. What does this concept mean? Um, in Zamak's book, she says something is a data product if it is discoverable, it is addressable. You can say there, that's where it is. Um, it is understandable. It's trustworthy. Um, it's truthful. Um, you can access it. And it is interoperable. So you can actually take that data product and easily take that one and, and mash it together. Um, but it should be valuable in its um, uh, independence as well. As a standalone product, it should have some value. And then obviously, if it's a product, you want to keep it secure and you want to control who uses it and for what purpose. So let's go into our wine story. And we think about how wine gets manufactured. And very simplistically, there is a value chain in creating wine. And every step in this value chain has inputs, it has a process, and it creates outputs. And we start on the, on the farm and we grow our grapes. And so there is a farm domain, if you want to call it that, but there is a farm, there is a farmer with the responsibility to grow grapes and to harvest those grapes. And you know what? In its um, standalone product that has value, I love grapes on my plate. So it can have in consumers of its own. But in our analogy, someone down the, mark, uh, the value chain buys those grapes and now juices it. And if that business is only in the business of juicing this and packaging it for consumption, then you know what? Juice, grape juice is a wonderful product and it has nice value. Um, but then someone else can take that juice and can now ferment it, can now enrich it and uh, manage it for a while and it becomes wine. And so the value chain continues. And we take that wine, we bottle it, we mash it up with other products, glass, label, cork, etc. We package it in a case and we make that available in stores. And our end consumers can consume the wine. Now, in a similar fashion, that is the four principles that you can actually hook everything in the data mesh around. Um, if the raw data that lives in your source systems are the grapes, then you might have teams out there whose primary focus is just to get that data onto the mesh and make it available for a whole bunch of data producers to consume. And this is where core principles like um, uh, data modeling comes into play, where you now say, you know what, we're going to land the data, but not like we did in the lake, data lake. We're not just going to throw all the grapes in there, because you know what, if, um, if the um, Sauvignon Blanc grape and the Merlot grape lands in the same um, bucket and gets trampled together 
and someone down the line does not want to make a blend, then uh, we have a problem. So we put some discipline in place here. We say, well, let's ingest our data, but let's transform it so that it is business centric. So that if customer data is sourced from line of business system one's um, system, as well as from line of business two, we get it to at least be um, standardized, be interoperable, so that each of those products exist on their own, but someone else downstream can easily take it and join it together to build a single view of enterprise customer. And so you carry on doing the value chain. Whether you are just enriching it enough for a BI report, or whether you are enriching it all the way for um, a machine learning model that gets embedded into an application on your digital um, front line. Data at every point in this value chain has an owner, has value, could be servicing end consumers directly, or could be further consumed down the value chain and further enriched. This is the principle behind the mesh. This principle says, instead of having one um, huge monolithic company that manages this whole value chain, we farm it out, we decentralize it and we create market dynamics of one team creating data products for another team purely based on that relationship and based on that agreement um, the market dynamics drives the um, shaping of your data and the value increases why because that's market dynamics hey if the cell is sitting here and the seller is saying, I don't care, I don't want the operations of growing the wine or growing the grapes. I just want to be able to source the best grapes and make wine. What do they do? They go upstream in their value chain and they go and negotiate certain quality standards of grapes, certain agreements with suppliers just because of that dynamic, just because of that interaction across your marketplace of data products, quality of data starts increasing, accountability of data starts increasing. And in this analogy, the whole framework of the data mesh gets captured. I'm gonna pause here because I see some activities on the chat. Any questions, any comments? You're on mute, Howard. There's a question. I wonder if you could help us. There's a question from John O'Gorman that came some time back, and, and I was wondering yeah. if, in a way, you had answered it, where John is saying the biggest challenge with data mesh seems to be the ownership of products and the lack of solid understanding between the distinction of standalone versus common mm -hmm. domain. Um, I, I get the feeling you've, you've answered or you've attempted to answer a lot of that in the two different slides that you've been through. Would, would that be a correct? Is there more to add there? And I would just like to check with mm -hmm. John if he feels that those, those areas have been addressed. Yeah. Yeah, not quite. Not quite. I had a, had a follow on question that seemed to get mm. chopped in half. But um, the follow on question is, um, if you have. If you have multiple sources of the same or similar data, does it make sense to have multiple teams building competing products? So you mentioned that you could have and I know customer has been beaten to death, but it's it's mm -hmm. kind of a it's kind of I think the reason That's is because is. I don't think anybody has any solid answers for it yet. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yep. Absolutely. Uh, does it make economic sense? Uh, I think it depends on um, how large your enterprise is. 
but as I as I said, if we uh, if we go back to our business model, um, here. If your different brands or your different lines of businesses, um, let's take financial services as an example. Um, an investment finance investment line of business versus an insurance line of business versus a lending line of business in financial services. You know what? There's certain aspects of customer that will always be common: demographics, occupation, etc. But then there's certain aspects of customer that is very unique to an investment line of business versus an, uh, a personalized insurance versus a corporate um, insurance line of business. Um, and, and that is something that I have personally experienced in enterprises that that goes the roots of saying, let's do this enterprise data modeling. Um, and you end up with master types and so many subtypes in your data model um, that just managing the data model across the enterprise becomes a nightmare. Whereas, and, and I want to get to that in um, when we go into the federated governance um, that she talks about, this um, market dynamics and the governance across this marketplace. I think, I suspect um, we are moving in that direction. I have a hypothesis, but it actually creates a space where you can have these duplicate models and have minimum agreed standards for different data domains. So have minimum agreed standards for customer, at least have a universal customer identifier. Um, and uh, a few kind of basic standards of value chains, et cetera, or um, customer verification, et cetera. But then eventually you do allow for, just like you would on an e-commerce site, have so many variances of Merlot, um, but it's well described. It has clear lineage, and clear record keeping of who's the owner of this specific data product. And it is potentially overseen by a governance person that just looks at the minimum standards that all products of the same data domain must adhere to. Um, and then you have these multiple products. Now, does that mean thinking about economies of scale? and thinking about your core question of, does it make economic sense? Does that mean you go and create a node on your mesh for every customer, and then a node on your mesh for every line of business's product data domain? No, I don't believe you do. Um, but that, let, let me take you through the next principle of um, the platform and then the federated governance. And, and then I think that can become clear where your economies of scale and um, uh, the economic sense in this um, comes forward. There's a lot of questions. Thanks, Hugo. How to migrate from traditional BI and data warehouse to this uh, data product approach? Uh, easy. Just take your data warehouse and call it your first node and then start creating more nodes. <laughs> I'm saying that in jest. <laughs> That's probably not that easy. Um, it's, yeah. Good one to chew on. Is it, isn't it coming back down to and I, I do understand that we've we've got that domain level. And mm -hmm. if your domain is aligned on your subject levels, and then you'll split those things up, and it, it all comes down to, as John is also referring to, is how do we break up those domains, and how do we allocate the domains and nodes appropriately? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think a lot of it's coming down to that now, the data as a product and the value chain, um, 
that was an interesting twist on developing your domain. So not yeah. not almost yeah. as we had subject area domains, you know, almost talking about is similar to the business value chain, your data value chain is enhancing the data and becoming nodes on its own. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, and that is where, remember I said, uh, the data mesh is not a, a um, single dimension approach. On the contrary, it's a multi-dimensional approach. So your domain data ownership and your data as a product concept are not standalone concepts. They are interrelated. Um, and it's not an either or scenario. It is rather an either and scenario. So if if I quickly flick back again to my operating model, let's think about um, a scenario. The I try to kind of depict all of the either or and scenarios out there. You could have a node in each of these brands that is only dedicated to, and when I say a node, I mean a team of maybe one or two data engineers with an analyst, and they are focused and they have their own little technology workspace. And their sole purpose is just go and harvest all the data from source for this line of business. Harvest the product data, the customer data, all the events, all the transactions, and make that data available on the mesh as native data products or atomic data products. Then you could have a different team um, depicted in these orange ones to say, these are the BI teams, you know what? And you might have scattered teams that is only BI teams out there in the business, and they consume these native data products, enrich it, restructure it for uh, corporate performance reporting, for operational uh, performance dashboards, etc. But in marketing and sales, maybe you don't have two separate teams. Maybe you have one team and they actually have that responsibility of getting marketing data, which is not in the line of businesses, onto the mesh and consume the marketing data as well as the line of business data, products. Consume that, build insights out of that and publish their insights back onto the mesh. Then you might have other teams that is purely data science teams. And these are teams that says, you know what, I'm not going to be looking, I'm not bringing source data onto the platform, I'm not taking that accountability. But I'm going to consume data from everywhere on your data mesh. And maybe I need governance permissions to even bring off platform data, off mesh data, ad hoc in external market research company data, survey data, you name it what they need. I want the permissions to bring that in, mash it up with the data I source from other data product teams and mine that for patterns, for predictive behaviors, etc. Um, so it's not one way or the other way, and it's not black and white. It is a whole mashup of different patterns that you can um, enable on this mesh and federates throughout your operating model. Let's quickly look at the concept of the platform. So this is the technology angle. And the paradigm around the technology shifts significantly. Where you in the past had um, a data team design a platform, go to IT, ask for the technology to be spun up, and then that data team works on that platform. Now 
you need to think very carefully in your operating model. So I'm going to go through this because there's a lot of detail in here. I'm going to go through it very um, quickly. Um, ThoughtWorks talks about what they call the different planes of technology experiences. And starting at the bottom, you're now going to have, because you have so many nodes, which is little small tins of infrastructure, people are in the cloud that are on-premise, um, but you have all of that, so now you need a team. She calls an infrastructure plane. You need a whole bunch of technologies that is specifically geared to get a platform team, um, like a DevOps team that is focused only on managing this platform, managing the resources, spinning up new nodes. If business suddenly says, I'm going to start up a, a BI team, having the ability to spin up a new node quickly to monitor activities in that node, to control that, to have so many different dev test prod environments and all of the technologies to monitor resources across that, to um, uh, enforce security controls across that, etc. Then you have the engineering experience plane. That is for each of those teams across your business. All of those different domain nodes of teams, this is each of their environments with the tools they need. The data engineering tools, the data exploratory and analysis tools, the um, visualization tools, um, the data science tools, etc. Nicely configured in their producer node so that they can have a safe end to end environment that enables them to fast track this engineering of data products. And then the final plane is for the consumers. And those are the people out there that's never going to build their own data product, but goodness gracious me, they need access to all of this data and insight available on the platform. So whether that is accessing BI reports or accessing data um, in physical uh, repositories, tables, or what, wherever that is, being able to query it, being able to analyze it, being able to explore it, et cetera. Or remember also, you might have different consumers. You, you might have consumers inside your turnstiles. You might have consumers outside. You might need to share data products out to third parties. You might need to publish um, business to business, um, uh, BI, et cetera. All of those, you want to enable in this. And then just um, in the spirit of this thing scaling out, imagine having so many different nodes, producer nodes. Some of the producers are only interested in creating native or atomic data products. So their tool sets might be simpler. Maybe they just need some ETL tools in there and a data store to publish it to. But then you have your BI teams who might want to enrich more, might want to visualize and publish data. And then you have your uh, advanced insights teams who then want the data science technologies added on, et cetera. So you now start thinking your, in your platform and thinking economic, uh, economically, where in the business do we uh, spin up which teams and give them the tools that is fit for their use cases and for what their maturity of, of, um, of working with data and their readiness to uh, advance in that maturity. Critical things that is gets a lot more emphasis in making such a mesh work is technologies that allows for searchability and discoverability of data. I'm going to go back to my wine, uh, uh, wine market, my e-commerce site. For those in South Africa, if you have a take a lot page, 
um, for everyone else, an Amazon page, you want that ability for anyone in the business to go onto such a page, go and search with English language for data products and find, get a Google response list of all data products that might answer the question you've just put on. But then that must guide them to say, okay, that data product sits with that team out there. This is the product owner. This is the person you talk to if you want to understand more. Just like on a take a lot page, the product must be well described. Um, and you should be able in this interface, in an ideal world, be able to say, hey, I want to use this product. I want to buy this product. Can I contract with the data product owner to bring it into my environment and to build other data products off of it? Okay. That is critical. And then with that, obviously, you want to be able to facilitate engagement and collaboration. But now with so many different interfaces and teams interacting with each other, your access protocols um, and control of access, revoking of access, et cetera, becomes more advanced. The critical thing is that each of these producer teams out there that is producing data products needs to be as autonomous as possible. But control and now quickly touching on the skills question that was answered or asked earlier. Ideally, you want to have a few producer nodes on this mesh that is for your heavy lifters, for your professional data engineers. But then for peripheral business teams, um, you need to think about how do we give them mashup tools, wrangling tools, etc., just so they're not that advanced, they're not professional data engineers, but they need to be able to access data, work with the data and publish light data products out. So you're going to now start thinking about functional requirements of multiple different communities and types of users. We are running out of time, I think. And the last one is the one that just clenches everything together. So if uh, if everyone is comfortable still, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna spend three minutes on this um, to bring it together because this ans asks all of the questions or answers the questions around ownership and um, protocols and. I'm going to go back to my wine story. I'm going to say way back years, years ago. In Bible times when they were manufacturing wine, this was much simpler. And there was no need for governance in this industry. But over time, governance had to come into play. There's now in the wine industry, I read one white, white paper just to build this analogy. There is extensive governance around fair labor practices of the, um, especially the pickers of grapes on farms, uh, farms out there, et cetera. Health and safety protocols, because we're working with food, essentially. We're working with something that people's going to ingest in their physical bodies. Product quality um, and, and standards for those product qualities. When, when does a product qualify to be export standard? When is it import standard, et cetera, et cetera? Um, all of those kind of governance sits outside of the market itself because, yes, there's big power players in the market. Um, and that has brought through scenarios that says, Hey, wait a minute, maybe someone needs to be uh, the cop. Maybe someone needs to just say, you know what, here's the minimum standards. And I always go back to our labor legislation in South Africa that says it is the minimum requirements for basic employment act. 
So your governance is not something that should become laborious, should not become huge reams of standards and controls, should be streamlined and it should be fit for purpose. Just to make sure that you create market dynamics here that really um, collaborates together and works together to uplift the quality of all data products across the value chain. So yes, you have things like minimum definition standards, minimum security standards, data quality standards, etc. This is where your data domain owners lie. They sit outside of the system. They are people that is, if you want to say, what is the definition of um, a South African citizen's residential ID number? Then you know what? There's probably someone out, uh, out there that you're going to make the domain owner for that specific one. And they're going to set the rule once. And then it just becomes a rule that all of the data producers across this value chain must follow as a concept. That's the principle of governance. But then the market dynamics here is um, the collaboration, the contracting from one data producer upstream to another data producer. And that collaboration, that is what actually drives the operation of data and drives up the quality of data. Can you imagine two people having a customer data product, but everyone in the business just consumes the one and they can actually on that take a lot of interface, go and type, I'm using this one because I trust this one. And the other one gets no feedback and no stars. That's what you want. And that's what's going to eliminate unnecessary um, redundancy of data products in the market. I am stopping there. I think this marketplace analogy of the manufacturing value chain is what brings everything together. It's all of these levers, um, governance, light, fit for purpose, but the collaboration and the contracting between different nodes that produces data products um, and the infrastructure that then brings that computational part of the governance by automated policies and um, principles like embedding data quality metric scores as part of every pipeline, um, standard patterns in pipelines, etc. Um, that is what brings everything together um, gradually over time. Questions? Thanks, Yolanda. Um, I'm just checking John's latest thing. Uh, John, any comments from your side? I know that actually the last part made uh, perfect sense to me, of course, because we start with business language, right, Howard? Yeah. So yeah. when you control when you control the um, the we use the upstream, midstream, downstream kind of thing. But mm -hmm. and I was happy to hear uh, Yolanda mention those words. But yeah. when you when you focus your control on the on the quality raw materials, uh, that makes perfect sense. And so does the competition um, for you know based on quality, because the midstream consumers of those data products from upstream will use the best quality um, raw materials they can find. And I think that's a great way to separate the wheat from the chaff, so to speak. So my dog's going to get loud here, so I'm going to mute myself. <laughs> I guess I... All righty. <laughs> as long as the dog's getting just as excited about this as I am, then that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those concepts are the definition of those concepts, the business concepts. Mm. Fantastic. Are there are there any other questions? It's um, twenty past six. I'm I'm happy to stay. Uh, any any other questions for Yolanda? So there are plenty. <laughs> there's there's so much to talk about. Thanks for the feedback, Martin.
Um, I think if you give me a month or three to continue my journey, then we should yeah. have another conversation. Well, that's excellent. I'll actually ask Debbie to schedule one for three months' time. Wow, okay. <laughs> no pressure. Thanks, Howard. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you very much. Thanks Thank you very everybody. much. I'm I'm on LinkedIn. Please let's continue this yes. conversation. Definitely. Um, we'll set one up and, and we'll see mm. how it goes. That will be right. fantastic. Debs, will you get that conversation going? Mm. Certainly. Excellent. All righty. Yolanda, thank you for it. And I, I'm not sure if we asked you if we could share the presentation online. Are you comfortable with that? Yeah. Yeah, I, I haven't put anything in here that is sensitive that you can't read in a book. Um, so yeah, yes. absolutely. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you very much. much. OK, thank you. Have a great thank evening, you. everyone. You too. Bye. Hi. Thank you. Thank you all. Manir, I know you had a question, Manir. Uh, I'm not. I see you still on. Was there a, was there a further question? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if we answered your question. No, no, I don't think there's a question. There's just more of a comment, but I think Yolanda covered it. It was okay. just about <laughs> creating quality data products. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah. I think I think uh, Yolanda did cover things. Yeah. And I think that's an interesting one, Yolanda. What we're also working with in our data products is almost building a, a CDE constellation. So your different data products are, are, are exposing those CDEs. Mm. Uh, yeah. We, now those CDEs are coming together. I see we've got a question, or, or Eric's hand is up. Yeah. Eric? Hi, everyone. Yolanda, thank you Hi. so much for the presentation. Um, my question would be about stakeholder engagement, especially the senior level. Um, it's an extremely complex and abstract topic. Um, I think if you're in the industry, you still struggle to to get the paradigm shift. But for for the senior leaders, for, for a business hat or even a, a CFO, where do they get the buy-in? Where do, does this really translate to value? Because maybe the last step that was missing in your wine analogy were the dollars at the very end when yes. the transaction happens or the transactions actually happen in between because it is a value chain. And mm. yeah, well, what, what's what's the key yeah, I think, here? I think the value, value chain concept, um, uh, your executive stakeholders understands that they understand market dynamics and they understand that flow and the wonderful thing the beauty of data is that is one resource that does not depreciate over time it doesn't it does not finish it does not run out on the contrary every time you touch the data you just create more um so uh, and so as you build this value t value chain think about my grape analogy if someone eats the grapes, it does not mean that there's less data left to make wine. Um, and that is where, where I think the scaling and the exponential value of this comes in. Um, yes, it does take a little bit of time. And I mean, I've been on, on 12 months journey now with one client. We're building this ground up. Um, but we're still having conversation on executive level. However, what we've done with them is to say, as we gradually start this mesh, and we're not going big bang, we're doing one node yeah. every now and again. Um, we're also creating one node where we start getting advanced insights out. Um, and we're working very intentionally with them on a top level to define very clear business cases and spin off a whole data science project that's just focused on that business case. And there they see money coming, being forecasted to come back. Yeah. And that return is more than enough to actually fund all of these atomic and information producer account uh, producer nodes and investments. Yeah, 
Now, thanks um, for that, because yeah. that just got me back to uh, an approach I learned earlier, those kind of self-funding strategies mm -hmm. where through a POC and the, the value at the value created in that mm -hmm. one POC, um, management sees, oh, this is really unleashing mm -hmm. value and we got a, a, a nice ROI from that. Let's yeah. fund the next initiative with that because this is how you can get a really nice like s snowball effect going in a positive way where mm -hmm. Uh, the whole thing creates its own dynamic and starts funding yes. itself, right? If yes. the management yeah. gets to see that or we make them see that. Yeah, I mean, the wine, wine analogy works because if, you, <laughs> if you're picking your low hanging fruit soon and you, you're showing them that value, then um, that's good. And, and that just buys them in enough for the next step, um, et cetera. So the key would be to find really um, very promising and very uh, high likely um, POCs that, that yes. get through because you need those initial wins to start yeah. building the momentum for more and then you stack mm. it up with, mm. uh, well, additional yeah. ones that are still very um, high probability ones. And mm. once you have a sufficient support in the management, then you can start cracking the, exactly. uh, the bigger ones um, mm. if management is still reluctant. So big hairy first Absolutely. might not be the right approach here, right? Mm. Too yeah. scary for some. Yeah, no, it starts small, quick wins often. Um, and once they taste a little bit of value, um, mm. that pays for the next one and for the next one. Yeah. Eric, if I can also add some advice there, change it from a proof of concept to a proof of value. Value. Uh, mm. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So do your commercial and, feasibility. So mm. what I've learned from um, focusing on data ROI or data value realization is a commercial feasibility that also gets linked to a technical feasibility from a people uh, and 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 do is try to get fit at uh, understand and quantifying the feasibility and there's a really nice value taxonomy that Deloitte has in terms of of being able to quantify both revenue and cost reduction, regulatory risk management areas, and, and learn how to, how to express a commercial feasibility that the CFO is in agreement with. Yeah, because they don't talk dollar and cents, so if it's proof of value, it's much easier with them. Yeah, yeah. yeah I agree. Yeah. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you so much. I'm loving the conversation. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> So we need to be uh, that value generation and I I'm actually interesting I've started to change this everyone's talking about data driven and I say it takes you too long to get there if okay. you can be data value driven you can change that tomorrow tomorrow you can start talking about value and how you're going to focus on the value but data driven it's going to be a long time before people want to go and just make a you know be driven by the data to make a decision it's not going to happen yeah. You get the discussion probably motivated in a different direction because when you can value it, when you can quantify it, uh, mm -hmm. you either get certain people curious about, okay, so you're saying there's a seven figure upside for us here. They, they might be even willing to in, invest more into it instead of mm -hmm. saying, you want to do some technology stuff. Yeah, 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 maybe yeah. later, you know, go, gone. Yeah. And I mean, that that you see from the history, yeah. uh, a lot of these enterprises have done a data warehouse, scrapped it, replaced it with the data lake, scrapped it, replaced it with um, a lake house. Um, and, and, and they're saying, I've been part of this organization's leadership for the last 15, 20 years. We've done this. We've reinvented the wheel three times now. I'm still not seeing the value. Yeah. yeah. That's the that's the challenge. That is unfortunately the legacy we are fighting um, yeah. in these conversations. Um, and that is if, if if we do it the Nike way, we just say, you know what, just give me a small piece and let me do it. Yeah. Here, let me show you the value. Now imagine 10 te teams being able to do this concurrently instead of one big team costing you millions a month to run, taking a year to get something out. 
Yeah. It becomes a no brainer. Yeah, and this is where I would argue the idea really of a community comes up and comes in as well, because you want to have knowledge exchange between the teams going on. Yes, they have their different business areas and business units that they work for, uh, but certainly they do have lessons learned and uh, some of them can probably be exchanged um, among them. Absolutely. Um, that is one one thing that we didn't get to, but um, the culture management, that centralized team you had, that paradigm needs to shift because that team now needs to, number one, enable, maintain and support the platform and make sure that when yeah. uh, people log in in the morning, their producer nodes are up and running and they can engineer. Um, but then you need to really have a core team that facilitates the skill building and knowledge sharing. Um, and then the critical thing is that data catalog that spans across all of the nodes so that you can search for your data products like you would on Amazon and, and people can read those data products because that is where truly the, the knowledge sharing, et cetera, happens. I mean, and these are the lessons we, we learned earlier on in data warehousing, yeah. having yeah. harmonized dimensions, having clear glossaries and, and, and definitions about what we are dealing with. So mm. this is not really reinventing the wheel. Yeah. This is like, OK, we've learned that like 10, 15, 20 years ago, and, and we're building on that, right? Yep, exactly. We're leveraging that and, and growing something. I think the catalog is pretty new, and, and I love the... Uh, I shared an example of the European data platform. They've got 1.4 million data sets spread across, uh, I don't know how many countries, but there's no actual movement of data. It's just uh, the metadata and they use something called DCAT API, AP, where they build a centralized catalog of trying to find the assets. So whilst we had those conformed dimensions, it was very much shared amongst the, the technical people, but not yeah. Chosen yeah. Now, yes. look, take a look at that European data platform. It's got it's got the API and the interchange of data from the different countries. So they've been able to build up 1.4 1.4 million open data set publications with a ranking of all the countries on the social impact, economic impact, and it's that type of collection and, and cataloging system that I think would be tremendous for this, uh, that, that sort of visualization for this type of. And mm -hmm. the nice thing is that it's broken up in subject areas to an extent that people can use different ways of navigating to find a data set that can be used for the research and whatever they're trying to do. And I think that is where technology still has to evolve a little bit because the data catalogs you have is really just kind of technical metadata catalogs. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you yeah. need to have that richness to be able to describe mm. your data products. Um, you need to be able to bring your lineage in, maybe yeah. even publish it with sample code sets, um, yeah. publish it with data quality metrics, um, yeah. et cetera. So that you can yeah, really have a, a full provenance of where the data comes from. And I like to, I like what the European people have done with an ODI over and above just the data catalog. They then go into more important ones for them being open data. They would have a validation on a quality level in terms of social and economic uh, and, and environmental impact. So they starting to get into different levels of quality impact or, or imp that they're having. Yeah. Guys, thank you very much. Awesome. <laughs> I think yeah. yes, we could go into the two, three hour mark. Um, <laughs> but thanks, John. Thanks, Eric, for the questions. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you Yolanda. so much, everyone. Thanks for sharing. Thank Cheers. Thank you. Cheers, everybody. Bye-bye. Right.